turn it over to her to get started. And um, we'll stop periodically and ask some questions, but feel free to go ahead and type in the chat box at any point. Thanks, Anna. So good afternoon, everybody. And I know I haven't asked if you can hear me okay. So if you could just in the chat box, let me know that you can. Great. So welcome. We're glad to have you all here. Our focus today is on Tier 2 and grouping students for interventions. Um, like Anna introduced herself, I'm one of the TA specialists for the PBIS project, and I also work with Florida Aware for TA and support to several districts up near Jacksonville area. So our objectives for this chat this afternoon is to review a couple of the critical features that we always talk about when we talk about Tier 2 being successful and then to focus on specifically learning some strategies to use data to group and identify students and grouping them effectively for Tier 2 supports. And last, talk about ways that we can improve your existing systems for Tier 2 in general. Usually when we have people come into these chats or Tier 2 trainings, they have some things in place and are just looking to improve those existing systems, so that's kind of our takeaway hope from these materials. So of course our focus is in on Tier 2 today, so we are building on top of what we know has to be a successful core and we are not focusing on those Tier 3 intensive individualized supports. We're focusing on the Tier 2 for our groups of students talking about some kids needing. So it's really important that we're not going to go into the individualized supports and that we're going to build on top of successful supports at Tier 1 when we talk about Tier 2. And this is of course that layer in the middle, we're going to layer on top of Tier 1 before we talk about implementing individualized intensive supports. Some key features we know of Tier 2 that we always talk about when we roll out um, Tier 2 trainings and we want to remind you of today is that we know you have to have a successful Tier 1 foundation before you can have success at any type of Tier 2 support. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. We want to make sure we're using data to drive what we do at Tier 2 and that it has evidence or research to support what we're doing matched to student need and the population that we're delivering it to. And we'll talk a little bit about that when we talk about grouping to needs as well. We're always going to be using that problem solving approach and one thing that's really helpful in the problem solving approach is right above that that we have progress monitoring data that whatever we implement we're tracking to make sure that it's successful or if it's not successful we have data to show that so that we can make effective decisions with what to do next. And then of course we're talking about that middle layer so we're laying on top of tier two it's preventative to hope that children will respond to this layer of support and not need that intensive level of support and eventually fade to go back to only needing that tier one core instruction. And so of course we're talking about that sum and it's part of this continuum. So we're relying on a successful tier one before we deliver tier two. And then of course there are some students that will need that tier two and then tier three layer. So we need that continuum of support available to us. One concept we always talk about when we're going to start developing tier two supports is that if we have a tier one environment that's not successful or not healthy, we're never going to have success at tier two. So the two examples you see listed here is if you know students are coming to you as referred to needing tier two supports and they're in an environment, whether that's school wide or a classroom, that's generating a high rate of problem behavior, we know we're not going to have success. Or we have an environment where we're not implementing key elements of tier one, such as teaching behavior or rewarding behavior. Both of those examples illustrate that there's an environmental problem at tier one that's contributing to problem behavior. So we can't intervene our way out of that. So we put that there as that, that key reminder of we want to make sure that tier one's healthy before we're looking at referrals for tier two supports and layering those on. With that mindset, we always put our big uh, red finger reminder here, your little ribbon on your finger to remind you that if you're seeing in your student data at your district or school level, that you're having more than 15% of your student population being referred for tier two supports, that's when you really want to be more efficient and effective and look at tier one and see what's going on in our tier one um, core curriculum that we could be adjusting to address that large need that we're seeing in our data. We're not having a positive response to what we're doing at that layer. So one thing we wanted to give some reminders about today is, is, is ways we identify students. Before we talk about grouping by common needs, we want to first think about how we're even getting those referrals to us of who needs Tier 2 supports. We want to think about this in a systemic way, and we're going to talk about our screening process in a little bit. 
we want to make sure, and, and I kind of ask all of you to think about what kind of data do you have right now when you do look at kids who are identified for Tier 2 supports. We want it to be more than just our, our ODRs or office discipline referrals. A lot of times schools rely just on that data and it, it won't give you as broad of a picture to know about needs and matching um, as far as group needs. A lot of schools start to use their minor or classroom tracking as part of this comprehensive data system so that they can catch behaviors that aren't severe enough to warrant a discipline referral, but would be um, behaviors that would warrant tier two support. We're gonna talk a little bit about universal screeners. This is another measure that some districts will add in to answer questions that maybe they don't already have answered through current data sources. And then also our teacher team nomination has been successful in lots of schools and um, as far as effectiveness and being a really practical piece of data to get teacher feedback at a classroom and then grade level. So before I kind of move on, I was just wondering um, if any of you do use universal screeners in your counties. If you do, if you could just indicate it in the chat box. Okay, so we have a couple counties um, that look like they're implementing tools of that. So when we get to that section, I wanted to make sure to ask for ways that you're using that type of measure in your process. But the key to this is that we want to use um, lots of different data sources. We want to be efficient, so we don't want to, um, and that's okay, sorry, if you're not sure what it is, we're going to talk about it in just a second. Um, but you want to think about what data sources do I currently have available to me in order to identify students who might need tier two supports. That's going to help us be efficient. What's currently already coming to us and we have a good system in place to look at that data and then start to think about what questions are maybe not answered right now by your current data sources. So when we talk about what data sources we have coming to us, these are all key pieces of information that could be useful to you. Um, I always highlight number six first because you really want to think of any data that could indicate lost instructional time to you. Um, we always or usually think of number one. We have office referrals. We have information on out of school or in school suspension. We sometimes have minor forms or um, information on those behaviors aren't, that aren't severe enough for an office discipline referral. Um, we want to factor in any data we have on attendance because, again, that's going to be factoring in lost academic instruction time, and then also can indicate lots of um, symptoms of internalizing types of issues. But we know that means they're losing instructional time, so that's good data to look at. A lot of schools are looking at tardies, um, not for a tier, I have a lot of schools who are looking at tardies on a tier one level, but it's also data if you have a more significant rate of tardies that could be useful for a tier two. And then we usually have pretty readily available data on academic needs for tier two. But we want to look at um, not only skill types of data, but maybe if they're struggling in math, for example, if they're having frustration behaviors during that type of academic situation because of their skill deficits. Um, then you see the other examples in seven, any of those visits, if they're going to the nurse office a lot, um, that can always indicate trouble with anxiety or withdrawal types of behaviors. But we know that means they're missing lots of instructional behavior for some reason. And this could be due, again, to like internalizing types of symptoms. Last piece is early warning systems data. For those of you in the county who are using early warning systems pretty readily and effective, that's been a nice piece of information for districts and schools to use um, because you can sort by multiple factors in most cases. So if I'm a high school that's wanting to look at kids who need tier two supports, I could look at a certain GPA with a percentage of missed attendance with a certain number of discipline referrals to group students who might need this layer of support. So those tools have been really helpful. The walk away from that last slide, though, is we need multiple sources of information to do this effectively. So we want to, you heard me mentioning internalizing a lot in the last couple examples, because sometimes those students with internalizing concerns are missed in this process. So using multiple sources of data helps us not miss those students. We usually capture pretty regularly those kids with externalizing difficulties that we can see, those more disruptive behaviors. We also want to make sure we're integrating as much as possible academic and behavior interventions. And I know Anna will give some examples of that a little bit later as well. But when we have kids who have both deficits with academic skills and then are also having problem behaviors, we can address both in tier two supports. And then any information we have on motivation is going to be very helpful to link function to actual support that we're going to deliver, which we know helps us make um, more effective grouping and supports available. 
we want definitely to get teacher feedback in this process, but we also want to have enough measures that keep us objective in terms of how severe needs are and what types of needs we're seeing to be effective at this and not just depend on teacher feedback. So walking away, you want multiple sources that are going to give you lots of views of types of concerns, uh, needs with concerns, and, and possible function behind behaviors. So I had asked the group a little bit about who's using universal screeners out there, because I don't think a lot of school districts in Florida are. Um, I know a couple of you said that you are. Um, these are some screening tools that could be used in a universal screening format where we screen all students to look for risk and usually give you risk ranges similar to academic measures that give you like low risk, moderate risk, high risk would give you information on students that you screen in that manner. So you could do some information uh, problem solving around risk ranges. So you see five listed there for you and I want to make sure not to forget the two resources for the, at the bottom listed for you. The first is a book that gives some good case examples or application examples with these tools, which is always nice to review if you're thinking of using one of these measures. The second is a chat that we have available. Oh, thank you, Anna. Um, Anna's mentioning there's also the screening tool matrix that's in the file share for you that we're about to look at. Um, and I'll reference that again in a second. Um, the universal screeners chat that's there on number two is also very useful as far as application of universal screeners process procedure considerations with that. So that's available on our website for you. Um, but back to the tool that Anna was referencing, because we're going to look at the next slide. If I was in a district and selecting one of these tools, there's lots of planning questions I would have. And I think this tool is nice to illustrate that. Um, and this is the tool that's available for you in the file share if you wanted to download that. So I'd of course want to know what population am I wanting to screen, what grade level, student age, because these tools will be normed on that age group. Or grade level and then I'd want to know what kinds of concerns that I'm screening for because if we're going to add on a measure like these examples it's because we don't have information already available to us that are indicating for example internalizing problems we want to keep it efficient so you're always considering what you have information and then um, what information you need to add on to make you more effective the other thing is I know we'd always want to know who's going to complete the tool, how long would it take to complete some of those logistical concerns that come up when we're talking about using a screening tool. So another reason I really, really like this chart um, as far as laying out some of those questions for you that would help with planning implementation of one of these. Um, Anna, anything else you'd want to add on that? Um, the other measure we reference that is very uh, popular, I know a lot of school districts are using this tool to add on to some of the existing data they have, is teacher nomination. So this process is very practical, very efficient, and has lots of research behind it. But it's a way of getting structured feedback from classroom level and then grade levels to identify students who um, may have never even received an office referral. So students we wouldn't commonly catch if we just looked at outcome types of data but we could be more comprehensive in catching some of those kids with low level behavior. We'll look at an example of this in the next slide, um, but we commonly follow a format with this where we look at teachers nominating and then going to a grade level team nomination to help prioritize. In secondary schools, I've seen this work whether with departments. When we say grade level, we commonly do it by um, departments. So there's a standard nomination form that we'll look at in a second, and it's commonly completed two to three times a year. So you're going to want to do this usually around when you're doing other types of screening information, like reading screening. You'd want to time that at the same time. Um, Jason, I see your question about a wide variety of completing these. Usually our teachers are going to be completing these. I have seen schools use various types of teachers in that school setting. Um, I have a district who just talked about parents nominating with teachers, and I think that's a great idea. Um, I haven't had districts use it that way before. Commonly, this is our teachers, and then, um, like I said, various types of teachers. Oh, the universal screeners. So on that chart that we just referenced before, you can see who completes. They have a column or a row, excuse me, that will explain who completes the actual measure. Sorry, I misunderstood that question. So as far as the nomination, they're going to be asked to identify your top three externalizers and internalizers. And it's going to help us drive, of course, that um, our student supports are matching need on this type of data with outcome. 
Um, when we use a nomination process, you're going to want to, of course, explain to staff how to complete the nomination form. And then um, a little bit, for example, definitions of what we mean by externalizing and internalizing, which is on the form for you. We're going to have to have some decision rules around who's going to receive these, or support, these supports once we get this information back with other outcome measures. A lot of schools will go ahead and decide, um, and districts will decide, what criteria is going to warrant Tier 2 support with the nomination piece and outcome data being considered in that decision rule. Um, a lot of times when we start at the classroom level, you're going to get support that exceeds the resources you have to provide. And so we're going to have to have some discussion about what that's going to look like when we do have that come into play. A lot of times when you move to that grade level of nomination, it will help you prioritize the students who are highest need as far as those um, supports that we have available to deliver. The other things listed below, you're going to want to decide how we're going to notify staff once they nominate. If students are going to receive support, what's that communication going to look like? Um, we've had sometimes where we nominate and use other data and we identify and we forget to actually go back to that staff and let them know that they were identified for support and what that support is going to look like. And we'll talk about that a little bit in the strategies later. Um, and then timelines. So it, after they're nominated, a good guideline is 10 days after that, we want to make a decision about providing those supports. And then the actual provision of the supports, 30 days is usually a good guideline for that after we've decided to provide that support. Family notification, you always want to know what are my district procedures or policies around family notification if the child is going to be nominated and having um, that Tier 2 layer of support. So always stay consistent with districts. So here is the form that I referenced as far as teacher nomination, what it looks like, and those are available through our project. Um, I believe that's also in our file share um, for you. And like I said, this is the teacher nomination form, and then there's also a grade level um, teacher nomination form. So it usually progresses from teacher or classroom level to then grade level to help you prioritize students. But remember, we mentioned explaining to staff before they complete, of course, how to use this tool, and you see some examples of that. They give some steps. They give some um, definitions of what we mean by externalizing and internalizing. That's always helpful for that. So we mentioned a screening, we mentioned screening tools. As far as the screening process, um, a lot of times we're going to be really planning out and having some key elements of how we're going to screen. So we want to know what resources are needed. For example, when we do tier trainings in counties, we always talk about a team and how that team functions. Who's going to be responsible for collection of the data and monitoring that data? deciding supports, group, then going to the actual grouping of supports. Um, we always talk about timeline, when we're going to screen, how we're going to screen, how frequently. Um, a lot of times we'll time it with when academic screenings are going on. For example, that three times a year, beginning, middle, end is a good recommendation, or some will just do it in the beginning or middle. Um, we always want to have an idea of resources that we have available for um, for delivery of Tier 2 supports. So we want to have an idea of that before we, as we're planning our screening process so that we don't over-identify when we don't have the supports to actually deliver those needs. And then the who piece, um, I mentioned a little bit with teaming as an example of a resource you need, but we need to have the roles defined of who's going to collect the data, who's going to input that data, and then who's going to be reviewing with that Tier 2 team um, afterwards. Um, decision rules comes up a lot and is really important as far as efficiency in this process. So one layer of decision rules we mentioned is who's going to receive those supports. What data are we looking at? Um, what criteria on that data is going to warrant that they're going to be delivering Tier 2 supports? Um, the other type of decision rules that we'll talk about is progress monitoring decision rules and how you define whether we're going to continue an intervention, fade it, or switch interventions. But in this chat, the most relevant decisions are on who's going to receive that Tier 2 support or are we going to be adjusting things at Tier 1 at this point? And then secondary, grouping those by common needs. Um, some decision rules with that as well. So being that being said, I was just going to ask one group question to the um, districts that are present. How many of you feel like you have a screening process in place? You have data that you use during certain times of the year to inform who's going to get Tier 2 supports. Are there districts that feel like you have that in place? 
process if you feel like you have a screening process that's in place. One good thing we always want to remind you of is make sure you're not collecting um, too much data to where you feel like you're drowning in it. Similar to this picture, we don't want you drowning in data. We want you to really think for, um, oh, Joanne, thank you. I can see you can only speak for Head Start. Um, and you do feel like you naturally have a process in place. Great. Um, as far as the data you do have available, that's kind of the walk away before we move into grouping, is that think about what questions do you currently have answered with the data you have available to you? And what questions you don't have answered. Those that you don't have answered is where you might look at adding something on, like one of those screening tools or the um, nomination process that we just talked about. Or just looking at what other outcome data that you don't have readily available that you might want available to make you more effective at that. But we don't want you to drown. We just want you to have those questions answered that you think are effective for you as far as who needs it. And then as we move into what they need, some of that data available to you. And with that being said, I'm going to hand it over to Anna. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you, Kat. Can you all hear me? <clears throat> Just, I know sometimes in the transition, it can be difficult. All right. Um, so, all right, good. Seems like most people can. So we've wanted to go through the process of how do you systematically identify students? Um, because oftentimes we know that we get stopped in the hallway and told, you know, so-and-so needs help um, right now. And that's not always the most effective or efficient way of identifying students. So it's really important that if you don't feel like you have a process in place or that your schools have something systematic that they're doing to capture both internalizing and externalizing behaviors and, and students who need those supports, I can't emphasize enough how much that needs to really be in place before you're um, worrying about um, mm -hmm. things like grouping. Um, so now what, right? We, we Now we know who needs help. What are we going to do next? Um, so there's a couple of things that we need to think about. Um, I've, I often, and I've been saying this a lot more lately, I think we're making Tier 2 a lot more difficult than it needs to be. Um, if we think about what it really is, um, it's meant to prevent problem behaviors from worsening. It's not meant to be real intensive interventions. And while we say that a lot, I don't know that um, we're doing, and when I say we, I mean everybody, doing that great of, um, of a job of keeping it as simple as, as, as it was intended. So first, we, we know we have to use that data, and that's why we spent so much time talking about um, ways to identify students um, other than getting stopped in the hallway or at the copy machine. And we want to make sure that we're providing interventions that are efficient and effective, but just not as intensive, because we're really thinking about targeted supports for groups of students. We're trying to really maximize our resources and um, it's not meant to be um, a really huge endeavor. Um, and that's what our effort today in um, this chat is to sort of think about what it is that we're already doing and how can we make it more efficient and more effective. So when it comes to grouping, we have some guiding questions to think about. Um, and especially at tier two, we wanna consider academics and behavior at the same time. Um, and if you're currently thinking about the group of people who come together to look at your behavioral data, um, when you're thinking about tier two, it's crucial that your academic person um, or somebody who can help to speak to some academic deficits is part of that conversation. Um, because the second guiding question asks if students have both concerns, academic and behavioral. Um, then you're thinking about of those students, do they have some academic needs that are similar? And we have to think about function of behavior across these similar students. So when we're thinking about function, we're not talking again about some kind of intense assessment. We're really at tier two, we're thinking about the fact that one behavior occurs repeatedly because it serves a purpose. And um, we want to think in the, in the as simplest of the terms as we can of what those different functions might be. And, and a lot of times at tier two, it still is our best guess. Um, we're not training teachers to really think about um, analyzing every behavior of every student, but we are asking them to think about a potential why they're engaging in the behavior that they are. And from a research perspective, we know that um, the same intervention for that same behavior could be counterproductive if that behavior serves different functions. So if we're trying to be efficient and we're trying to be effective, but we're not considering function, then um, we're being counterproductive. So our interventions will be much more effective when they are aligned. But again, at tier two, we're not doing an intensive functional-based assessment. I'm 
So a lot of times once we hear that word, folks start to think real individualized. Um, so while we are considering it, we're not um, making it an intense process. So you all might recognize this slide. We share it um, many, many different trainings, but I think when we're trying to explain to teachers or faculty or staff at our school exactly what we're talking about when we say function, um, we're really breaking it down into these just very basics. So is the student trying to get or obtain attention, maybe from adults or peers? Um, are they trying to get something tangible or get to a preferred activity or um, task? Uh, or are they trying to get to some kind of, of sensory stimulation? Or on the opposite end of that, are they trying to avoid something? Um, so especially when we're talking about avoiding tasks is really where that academic piece is crucial to know. Um, it's a lot different if I'm avoiding a task that I know how to do versus avoiding a task that I have a deficit in. So we're keeping it simple, but I think this is uh, a really great thing to share if you're not already collecting that kind of data and you want teachers um, or faculty and staff at your school to be collecting it. You have to explain to them what that could possibly be, and, and this does a pretty good job of that. Um, sometimes our existing resources have that possible motivation on them. Um, I've seen a lot of schools move to collecting that information on referrals um, or on classroom tracking forms. <clears throat> and again, it's just, we know it's our best guess. Um, I know a lot of times during tier two training, we have folks um, concerned about this. So my suggestion always is to train the folks who are filling this out um, as to what you mean by those things. Um, if you are doing nomination forms, their possible motivation is on that. And we can always ask, right? If it's not something we're currently gathering, but we know we have students who need supports, um, instead of waiting until we change those forms or, or redo our nomination, you can just ask teachers what their best guests are and, and especially ask family members what are their opinions of, of why the student's engaging in that behavior. <clears throat> so the next step after that, we have an idea of our group of students who need help from our, our systematic process. And then we have some idea about why these students might be engaging in this behavior. Um, now we're thinking of sort of, um, I'd like to think of it as three sort of broad buckets, so to speak. So the first one being um, pro-social skills. And <clears throat> what we would want to do is, is to think of those students who maybe need what we're thinking of as friendship skills or relationship building skills. And a lot of times what we're trying to do is to teach them replacement behaviors for avoidance or for withdrawal. So we're trying to teach them the skills that they would need um, based on on those ideas. So we're trying to build up what those social skills might look like. Um, typically, we see students who need problem solving skills. I hear this um, often referred to as anger management groups. Um, and I guess I always have a, a little bit of problem, especially at elementary school, thinking of sending our students down to their, their anger management skill group. Um, so I think problem solving is probably more accurate of what it really is because we're trying to teach them skills that they can have when they are faced with anger. Um, maybe instead of fighting or arguing, what are some other more appropriate skills that they could engage in? And then the last bucket is really thinking about academic behavior skills. So those are those kinds of things that come naturally to some students and definitely need to be taught explicitly to other students. So I think we can all reflect on some child that we've seen when we walked into a room whose desk is just out of control and they're up out of their seat and they're walking all around and sort of oblivious to the fact that that's not what everybody else is engaged in. And despite being taught the expectations and being taught um, what everyone else gets taught in terms of how to be organized, they need some more instruction to be supported. So those are the kids that aren't going to be in the office all the time. They're not going to be generating lots of referrals, but the, the things, the behaviors they're exhibiting are interfering with their learning and interfering with instruction. So we want to teach them replacement behaviors for getting out of your seat or having those um, poor study habits. Or even the, um, the child who raises their hand but talks out at the same time, uh, we want to make sure that they're really being taught how to have those pro appropriate academic behavior skills. All right, so where do we start, right? Now we have all of those ideas and now we have to actually do something. Um, so. As Kat mentioned before, the reason why we said improving an existing system is that most of us are doing something at tier two, right? We have some kind of group, um, or maybe we have a version of check-in, check-out. We're, we're doing some things. So always look at what are those supports that currently exist? Do we have, 
our anger management group? Um, or do we have um, some, a, some kind of support for social skills? You know, what does that look like right now? So we sort of have that list of what our current supports are. And then the next thing we need to do is we need to review the needs of the students that we've identified. And we've identified them, but we've also thought about why they're engaging in that behavior. And we can see right now, can we match them? Um, and not in a, stre a stretch of the imagination, but is there a natural match between the groups we have up right, right now versus the needs of our students? And nine times out of 10, um, groups and teams come together and look at this data and they realize, yes, we absolutely have some things. We have a social skills group that is specifically talking about friendship skills and that would fit very nicely for these couple of students. Inevitably, there's going to be some supports that we need that just aren't existing right now. So instead of trying to fit, make students fit into what we have, we need to really take a look at what do our students actually need and then um, how can we access those missing supports without overburdening um, the resources that we have. So that's what we'll talk about in the next couple of slides. So I mentioned some natural grouping. So this is a picture of some of those students I was talking about who just um, always seem to be walking around with 100 books and everything out of place um, and getting really frustrated as a result. And then we have some of those students who are more of our internalizing students who maybe do need some of those um, additional skills around, you know, how, how do I make a friend and um, <clears throat> what kinds of pro-social skills might I be missing um, to really be engaged in, in what's happening at school. And then we do have some of our students who need some problem-solving skills. So those are going to be some natural fits that we have. However, we know that there are lots of students um, who don't exactly fit into that. And this is where we're thinking about um, those academic pieces as well. So I'm just going to flip back to this real quick. So these are students who need some additional supports, but, may, but academics are not an issue for them. Um, so our, my problem solving skill group, are those are the groups um, of students who are constantly fighting, arguing. Um, they really struggle with con controlling when they feel mad. Um, and it's resulting in a lot of either disruptive behavior or it's generating referrals so that they're out of the class. Um, but they're not necessarily doing it to avoid any kind of task because they don't have those deficits. Same thing with my academic behavior skill group. Um, they need some help studying and they need some help organizing, but it's not as a result of not being proficient in reading. They're proficient in the academic tasks. It's just they need those other kinds of um, skills that can help them to be really successful. And my internalizers, my pro-social skills group, um, same kind of thing. Yes, they need um, some additional supports, but it's not in any kind of academic content area. So we have students with lots of needs, right? Um, I'd say more often than not, our students who do need additional supports with behavior, most, most of the time need some additional supports with academics. So it might be these, this group up here, and really that Poor person at the top left should have been included in my little circle. Same thing, I think it just got, <clears throat> got a little bit different um, when we put it up here online. But we're thinking of these two separate groups. So it's everybody at the top and then everybody at the bottom. So my top group, they're really struggling with math. Um, we've identified that they need additional supports, but they also have really significant deficits when it comes to math. Um, so the idea here being that they're already coming together as a small group because they need that additional remediation when it comes to math. Within that group, um, they also need some kind of supports for when they faced frustration when it comes to math. So I don't necessarily need to have two completely separate groups for them, one that helps them to deal with frustration and one that helps them to deal with math, because those frustrations are going to come up naturally during times of remediation. Just because they're in a small group doesn't mean um, that they're not going to face frustration. So the person running that small math group can help to, one, show them what they can do um, when they do become frustrated, and also it's a natural opportunity to practice that because they're faced with a task that's going to cause them frustration. My bottom here um, group is my reading group. And they're the, my group too that also has some really significant deficits when it comes to reading. And what they're going to be doing here is not only come together for my um, academic reading time in my small group, but I'm also going to be able to use break cards when I'm not in my small group. And the person who is going to be doing the reading with my small group is going to teach me how to use those break cards. 
so that when I am doing my 90 minute block of reading and <clears throat> I do start to want to shut down because reading is so difficult, I know that I can access uh, break cards, so I'm doing that appropriately. So that's available to me as a tier two resource. I don't need to go to a, a completely separate group to learn about um, how to appropriately take breaks. And also, once again, it's a natural place to practice that skill because I am going to be with this reading person and not only can they show me how to do it, I'm going to be meeting with them regularly where they can check in on the fact that if I am doing it, if it is working um, and, and how that's going. So we have those two groups that I think oftentimes we feel like when it comes, especially when it comes to academic supports, that um, we don't have time to add anything on because that time is very sacred. And I'm not saying that it's not, but I think that there it is a natural opportunity to provide supports so that we're not making tier two harder than it has to be. Uh, and then there's just the grouping as needed. Um, sometimes we have ongoing groups for things that really um, aren't occurring all the time. Um, but we know that it's what we've always done, so we just keep having them. Um, and that's, again, not a real effective use of our resources. So there are things that we can sort of just have on standby if needed. Um, so things like bereavement groups um, or when children are experiencing some kind of changes in their family um, or there's an incident of trauma. Um, we're, just, we're not thinking of this as an intensive individualized intervention because I'm not going to need that for a long period of time. I've had really something specific happen um, where I need help around that one particular issue. So what lots of places have done is um, really connected with those community agencies. So connecting with hospice, if there's times where you, bereavement is an issue and you do need to have that support at your school. Um, SEDNET is another discretionary project that folks can access who can help to connect you with community agencies who can be on standby to um, provide those supports. Or if it's something that you need ongoing, you can also have those conversations with them as well. We always talk about um, on your tier two team, there should be somebody who has knowledge of district resources. Um, and that really should be a member of, of any team when you're talking about behavior, but access that person. Uh, maybe it's your school social worker, maybe it's your school psychologist, maybe it is just somebody who, your principal or administrator, or someone who has awareness of what other district resources exist beside what's currently at your school. And um, with that knowledge, what we've seen be really successful with lots of places is that they partner with neighboring schools. So if I'm um, if I have a school that has an existing support that you don't have, and maybe perhaps you have one that I don't have, to partner together to either one, have me train somebody at your school or support somebody in, at your school in getting that group going, um, or if you're close enough and your district allows for you to have students come over to your school um, or your campus to receive that group and then vice versa, that works out well too. Um, if you know of your, if your districts have resource maps for behavior, um, just knowing what some other schools have access to is often really helpful to just even have those conversations of, you know, we have this need, how did you address it? Um, those kinds of conversations can save us lots of time um, in recreating the wheel. And I know I say that statement um, a lot, but it's true. If somebody's already began creating that wheel, there's no sense for us to, to start from scratch. Okay. So, oh no, I got cut off too. So my pro-social skill group is going to participate in, um, no, I'm sorry, my problem solving skills group is going to participate in I Can Problem Solve. And we know that this curriculum is good for preschool through sixth grade. And if you wanted to see an example of a lesson plan, you could copy and paste that um, link. This PowerPoint's also available for you to download, so you could even um, copy it from there. But this specifically teaches problem solving skills. So. Um, it's those kids that we just talked about who have trouble handling frustration, disappointment, anger, um, and they can learn some very specific skills in how to do that. If you have students who have some academic behavioral skills, I'm just going to jump ahead a slide for a second. There is um, an intervention called um, Homework, Organization, and Planning Skills, HOPS, and you can um, actually find out more about that on NASP's website. But um, what this particular school that we're thinking of um, in designing those groups, 
they, as part of their tier one, everybody got these, got this instruction. So everybody got these skills of, you know, how can I do homework effectively? How can I be better organized? How can I plan for assignments? So it's taught and retaught. And um, what we can do is for those students who are still struggling, even after getting what everyone else got at tier one, we can help to work to work to reinforce the things that, that they've already learned. So that comes back to check in, check out. So we can do a check in, check out with the use of those strategies so that when I check in in the morning um, and I am getting my daily behavior report card, the person I'm checking in is you know, connecting with me, reminding me of some of those strategies that I learned through HOPS. And then I'm also being connected to my school wide recognition system. So when I do demonstrate those strategies, I am able to receive more dragon, extra dragon dollar, or I am able to access whatever it is that um, that I'm seeing school wide. So I'm not creating a whole separate layer of recognition and reward. I'm just getting some additional um, tier one, which we know is, is the whole point anyway. So for those kids that are reinforced um, when they're demonstrating those and <clears throat> they're checking out with an adult in the afternoon. So if there are some of those skills that were taught, but it just didn't seem to work for that person. And I always think of us as adults. Um, we everybody has a different kind of calendar they like to keep right not one way works best for everyone but it took us a whole lot of tries to figure out what that one way is going to be um, so here we have the opportunity to teach something that maybe works for most people and then also help those students to really try to figure out what's going to work best for them all right um for, for social skills uh we can use the curriculum coping cat and this is really helps with children um, 7 through 13 um, around issues of anxiety. Now this is a 16 session group. So we would want to take a look to to make sure you want to make sure you're doing it with fidelity. So if you're looking at the manual and it's saying that you need to do the 16 sessions, it's really important that we don't just pick and choose the ones that we like to do because um, they're the most fun. We need to make sure that we're sticking with what the curriculum is intended to be. So it's definitely beneficial for students having anxiety. Um, and that's just one category for internalizing behaviors, but often that's absent in our groups. And just by teaching social skills isn't always getting at those students who have a lot of that anxiety. We just included um, second step, um, just to remind you all that it is evidence-based and it does work. And um, lots of folks have been using it for tier one, but it is really effective for tier two. Um, and that is okay to be able to pick out those specific lessons that talk about whatever it is your targeted group needs, because it's very explicit in social with social emotional skills, and we can make it for, um, purposeful for that targeted group. So there's an example of the scope and sequence of second step, and there are packages for pre-K, for elementary, and for secondary. And don't forget about our ever popular skill streaming. I always tell folks that if your school is older than um, at least 10 years, you probably have a copy of skill streaming somewhere in your building. Um, there's a, a period of time, especially if you were ever an ESE teacher um, or have an ESE teacher at your school where everybody was receiving multiple copies of this. And, and it really is because it works and it's short and effective. Um, and we can do, again, pull out those pieces that we know that our students need specifically. Um, there's one for early childhood, uh, for elementary, and then all the way through adolescence. <clears throat> so as we're closing out um, for the day, um, and before I ask you one last closing question, <clears throat> I can't stress that's the second bullet enough in terms of essential features of Tier 2. Um, I think one of the things that's largely absent when we do our Tier 2 interventions is the connection with teachers and families. So if we are teaching, if we are pulling out a small group, and I'm the teacher of that class. All I know is I'm seeing that student who does who desperately needs some extra help leaving with you for those 30 minutes or however long that 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 group takes and then coming back. Um, if I don't know the exact strategy being taught, then it's really difficult for me to one use that same language that you're using or for me to provide opportunities for the student to practice whatever skill it is that they need to practice. And it's really difficult to reinforce when they're doing what it is that they were practicing doing with your group. Uh, it's same thing with families. Um, if we're not, if we're using specific language to help children to problem solve, but nobody else, no other adults in their day-to-day -day life know what that language is, um, or maybe are using some inconsistent words, then it's really difficult for me to be practicing that skill 
um, or for anybody to really understand when I'm using it if they're not aware of it. And families can be a great resource. And I'm, I'm going to guess that if you are seeing those um, some kinds of behaviors that need support in school, um, chances are families are seeing them at home if no other time but when they have to do homework um, at the very least. So they would benefit from having some of those words and having some of those vocabularies or prompts to be able to reinforce whatever's going on um, during those small groups. We need to have really specific ways to provide feedback to students as well. So if I'm modeling a lesson and we're practicing it and they're demonstrating it and I'm, I'm giving them feedback, I need to make sure that the other adults know how to give corrective feedback as well. So that we know that behavior doesn't change overnight. It would be nice if it does, but, but hopefully we all know that that's not the thing that's going to happen. So we need as many people around that child to be prompting and to be correcting um, in an appropriate way. Because um, you know, I know that we're all human. It does get easy to get frustrated again when we see that behavior that's been going on, but we need ways to provide corrective feedback. And um, if you are a person who is either delivering tier two interventions or you're um, responsible for supporting schools that do that, I think one of the best uses of our time is to make, really decide even before we start the group, how or what, what supports are we gonna give to other folks to be, be able to support this student? Um, in absence of that, we're just, Take, plucking the, the child out, <laughs> giving them some wonderful strategies, and then just putting them back in and expecting it to magically work. And, um, and I think that's where a lot of folks get really frustrated with tier two and feeling like it's not successful is because we miss that really critical piece. So some of the curriculum that we were talking about do, they have, this is an example from second step, they have a home link reminder, um, they have some already parts in there that would tell you those keywords, <clears throat> excuse me, that would tell you keywords that, that um, other adults could use, what the home link reminder is, so that you can even email it or just send copies home, um, and then some questions that we can ask around whatever um, social emotional skill it was that we were doing that week. So if you're accessing a curriculum or thinking about using one, wonderful if it already has that piece in it. Um, with skill streaming, there's the skill cards, so we can connect with teachers and families. It's not like we are asking um, teachers to do you know, one more crazy thing. Um, we're just providing them some of the language that they can use to support that student. <clears throat> and if this teacher had nominated that student for needing supports, chances are they're, they'll embrace using a couple of different words um, if it would mean that they would see some kind of improvement in that behavior. All right. And then, um, Lastly, we always have to consider, and that's a chat for another day, um, who is going to provide those interventions and then when, um, and even more so too, how are we going to progress monitor and how are you going to measure fidelity? We have some resources for this on our website. Um, so if you go to our homepage under resources, there is a, a, there is a tab for tier two. Um, but before we finished up, I wanted to just ask what are some of you all doing for grouping and for interventions? What's currently existing at your schools in terms of that? Multiple people are right, are typing. Okay, so good, so you're using second step and that's in Head Start, right? Okay, check in, check out. Okay, okay, good. Um, so now, um, if you're already using second step or a check in check out you can think about how can we make it more targeted but then also are we sharing with um, our teachers and families those words and considering using check in check out for some of those academic behavior skills um, i think a lot of times we think about building relationships which we do need to do but checking in in the morning is just a great way of reteaching some of those um, before the school day starts okay Okay, good. You know, Carrie, we hear that a lot. We have check-in, check-out. It's just not real structured. Um, and I think one of the nicest things is if you have something already existing, you can always structure it up um, a lot. It's hard to even just get things going sometimes. So it's good that you have something in place and just um, building off what you already have. All right, okay, good. Um, and then, yeah, any targeted lesson plans, it doesn't have to be um, you know, a six-week group. There's nothing that says that there's a you know, you have to go to X amount, um, you know, unless the curriculum says that. 
Uh, but if you do have the behavior report card piece, then that can help you to progress monitor as long as you're making sure what you're doing is working. And then the other piece I always tell folks is make sure that you are keeping track of what you are doing so that if you do some targeted lessons around one specific behavior and it did work with those students, that you're able to do it again, you can replicate it, and then you can do it with some at least some sense of fidelity because you're replicating what you did. Um, a lot of times I hear folks say, yeah, you know, I did this terrific group for, and, you know, for X amount of weeks and I pulled these lessons from all these different places but they didn't really keep track of exactly what they did, so it was difficult to repl replicate after that. <clears throat> Are any folks incorporating um, tier two strategies into academic groups? All right, school by mentoring off track rate. Okay, good. Good, good. I, I like that idea, Troy, of kids get um, on track, get PBS so that <clears throat> they're still accessing um, what's happening at tier one, um, but they're getting some of that targeted support. And mentoring is a, a great um, tier two support, uh, especially when it's done specifically as um, students are nominated or identified as needing additional assistance. Um, sometimes I think folks um, put mentoring in place and just, you know, sort of just pick what students they think would benefit from it. It's really great when you can put some data behind it. All right, good. And Janet, you're looking at academic data to see if it correlates to behavioral data at all. Yeah, I think that's really important, especially when you're talking about um, additional supports, layers of supports. We, you know, we want our students in the class, but if we're pulling them six different ways for six different um, interventions, then uh, it's sort of defeating the purpose. Right, right, Kat, thank you. It does, it helps for more efficient grouping. Okay, yeah, I think um, that's a good point as well, Troy, that it's difficult to plan programmatically in the middle of the school year. Um, so one of the recommendations definitely, it, exactly, I don't think anybody is sitting around looking for um, something to do. What some schools have done is, um, you know, after, They've been try sort of trying some things at tier two uh, before the master schedule gets set for the school year is um, is identifying where some of those blocks of times might be. And <clears throat> maybe at the beginning of the year, if there isn't anyone, which seldom happens, but anyone who needs that, it can be used as some kind of enrichment time, but at least you've held some of that time sacred so that you aren't scrambling around in the middle of the year trying to figure out you know, when, when is this going to happen. Um, there are, and that being said, you know, we do have our full day tier two uh, training, and this is by no means is meant to replace that. Um, if you're looking for some additional resources, we have a chat on tier two decision points that was done and recorded and is posted online. Uh, we also have one on using universal screeners. So those are archived um, under our monthly chats. Um, if you are school-based and you are interested in Tier 2 training, you can contact your district coordinator. Um, if you are a district coordinator and you wanted to get the Tier 2 training at your district, then you would just want to contact your, um, your project contact um, for your district. Okay, good. So Janet says you have some enrichment or remedial time. Good. And that's perfect. I think that's where if we have it built in, it's better to have it built in and not need it than need it later um, and not be able to find it. Finding time is way harder than, um, than, than having exactly. Having time is half the battle. That's what I was trying to say, Kat. Thank you. Thank you for that help. All right. Um, so that brings us right to 4 o'clock. Um, is there anything else that any folks had questions about or anything you wanted to ask before I ask you the final poll question? I see a couple of people are typing, so I'll just wait a second. We do know, we do recognize you don't have a lot of time, so we do appreciate the time that you had today. Thanks.